Hello everyone, this is Richard from Modern Healthy Hong Kong. Welcome to part one of our interview series with Professor Nir Barzilai, Aging and Lessons from Centenarians. In this video, Professor Barzilai, who currently runs the biggest center for the study of the biology of aging, will provide his insight into the state of aging study and his work looking at centenarians and what we can learn from them. And with that, let me start the interview. Dr. Nir Barzilai is the founding director of the Institute for Aging Research at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and the director of the Paul F. Glenn Center for the Biology of Human Aging Research and of the National Institute of Health's Nathan Schock Center of Excellence in the Basic Biology of Aging. Dr. Barzilai discovered the first longevity gene in humans and has since discovered several others. In addition to his longevity gene research, Dr. Barzilai studies key mechanisms involved in the biology of aging including how nutrients and genetics influence lifespan. He is also investigating the physical and mental decline associated with aging and how they can affect longevity. He is the author of over 270 peer-reviewed papers and a recipient of numerous prestigious awards including the 2010 Irving S. Wright Award of Distinction in Aging Research and the Ibsen Longevity Award. Dr. Barzilai's new book, Age Later, Health Span, Lifespan, and the New Science of Longevity. The book reveals the secrets his team has unlocked about superages and the scientific discoveries that show we can mimic some of their natural resistance to the aging process. It also defines aging as a phenomena that can be targeted like other diseases. So, um, Dr. Barzilai, welcome to Modern Healthy Hong Kong, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And my, my name is Nir. Uh, like not far so not far. i'm in new york and you're in hong kong but let's be near now let's be near okay so near thank you very much for joining us this morning i just read your your book um age later and i saw that it was number one bestseller in the amazon physiology section so congratulations on that um I, I found it very interesting and informative so from the book i think you take a different approach to studying longevity from uh, some others in the field so um, and that you're looking at centenarians and what we can learn from them. So can you talk a little bit about your approach and uh, what, uh, why you chose that way? Well, let, let me just uh, start, in order to understand my approach, just start with a statement, you know? Mm. Aging has a biology, right? We know that. We know who's old and who's young. I think what our mothers didn't understand and what's new is that this biology can be targeted. Okay, we know how to target aging, we know how to delay aging pretty much, and we've done preclinical studies with lots of methods in many ways. And so we went from a hope to promise, and that's where we are now, on a promise. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, COVID-19 underlined this promise, maybe we can get to that uh, later. Um, I'm running the biggest center in the world for the biology of aging, and it's true that I have centenarians, but I actually did most of my studies in uh, rodents and cells and physiology and neuroscience. So I'm, I'm not exclusive to centenarians, but why, why did I come to centenarians? Because we've done something really smart uh, in aging. We, rather than go and understand the complexity of aging rather than describe that's what happened and that's what happened and that's what happened. We uh, found models that live longer, not mm. only longer, they, they live healthier, or I should say live healthier and also side effect, live longer. And from them, it's, it's not that we understood everything we have to understand about aging, but it gave us a shortcut that allowed us to form what we call hallmarks of aging, or I like knobs of aging. You know, we have eight knobs of aging, which to be a knob of aging or hallmark of aging, it means that somebody showed that he targets that pathway and something happened to your health and longevity. Okay, mm -hmm. so we kind of agree on that. Not only that, they're an interactive net in the sense that if you change one of them, you can, you can influence others. Uh, so this has been really a, a great promise, this approach. And, and so when I came to the field and I was using, when I came to the field, the main model 
was the caloric restricted model. You know, you take animals, you caloric restrict them, they live longer, healthier by a lot, okay? But, but as the models came out and the genetics of those models came out, I said, why don't we look at humans? Because 100 years old have, have really doubled almost their life expectancy. I mean, when I started the study in 1998, okay, mm-hmm. 100 year old at 1998, his friends have died on average when they were 40. If they got to 40, they lived until 60. But boy, they've been uh, alive for a long period of time. This is a very exceptional longevity. What is special about those guys? Why did they live so long? That's why I approach those centenarians. I would say another thing, you know, the pharmaceuticals have done a lot of mistakes that, that we kind of realize that's how science goes. Uh, they went to us scientists and said, we want to understand the enzyme, the protein that you're interested in, and, and maybe we can develop drug accordingly. Pharmaceuticals now, and I would highlight Regeneron because that's what they're doing. They said, you know what? If we had 7 billion people in the world, if we had their, uh, their genotype, their, their whole, whole, whole genome sequencing, and their electronic medical record, we would find any disease in the world and we will cure every disease in the world. Why do we have to go from cells to animals to humans and find out what's relevant and what's not relevant? So the idea of using genetics to understand difference, why some people are sick or not, but also why some people are, have exceptional longevity or not, was what I thought I should do, you know, 20 years ago. Mm. Right. Although I thought that was one of the first ideas was that, you know, a lot of the diseases would be genetics based, but then as we, we looked at them, we saw that they weren't so much genetics based as epi, epigenetics. And then it, there was kind of this layer on top that had a bigger effect. Uh, the, uh, you know, it's not or, or it's end, end there. Right. There's an epi, you know, epigenetic is a major uh, driver of aging, we think. <laughs> uh, but, you know, if you're born like uh, our centenarians have actually functional mutations in genes mm. that have protected them from aging independent of their epigenetics. Uh, so I, I think both, both are right. Um, but, but, you know, they're, they're clearly, you know, people are born with single genetic disease that have a huge phenotype, you know, Tysox, you know, or something like that, you know, that's all genetics. You don't need epigenetics for that. Um, there are people also with complex diseases or with, or, or uh, age related, like cardiovascular disease that have mutations in genes of cholesterol or something like that with very high penetrate. Um, but there are some genetics that has some predictive value, but most of the genetic is not as good as having a disease or having a, or having a test, right? I mean, who cares if you have cholesterol genes? Okay, what we care is what's your cholesterol really, you know? Yeah. So, so I, I, I just, wanted to make sure that uh, that I'm not I'm not taking off the table <laughs> a, a, anything but but I'm agreeing that it's it's not only the genetics it's epigenetics is as, as you mentioned David Sinclair uh, believes that that's a major of the hallmarks of aging mm. I, I, I and I, I don't think it's everything but I but I think it's one of the major hallmarks of aging so going from genetics so you've identified um, like uh, a, a gene that raises, say, HDL, because HDL, ha- having high HDL is, is a good thing. Um, I understand from when you get old. Um, and then, so how would, you, how would you use that knowledge that having identified the gene to then turn that into some kind of a treatment that would be available to people who don't have the gene? 
Right, that, that, that's a good uh, question that really, I, I appreciate you asking because it needs education. You know, the genetic study, our results of genetic study doesn't mean, oh, we have to have a gene intervention, not at all. Our genetic studies is to find mechanism, okay? And, and uh, so we have two examples, two genes, I'll just name them uh, CTP and APOS-C3. Mm -hmm. And both genes, we have functional mutation in those genes in a significant percentage of centenarian and not, not in our control population. So they seem to be unique for centenarians. And those centenarians have high HDL level and low triglycerides level. And the way, uh, and what happened is pharmaceuticals, Merck on one hand and Ionis on the other hand, um, came to us in order to understand the data and we showed them the data and they went ahead to develop drugs. Why did they develop drugs? Because they said if they're centenarians that actually exhibit exactly what the drug is doing, then for them it was a safety issue. You know, it means that exposure <laughs> to <laughs> this phenotype doesn't kill anyone, okay? They didn't think that it's a longevity issue, they thought it's a safety issue. So there's an example where our research contributed to the development of two such drugs. Both of them are inhibitors, by the way. Right, so, okay, yes. So can you, so you studied some centenarians, can you talk a little bit about like the centenarians? So do they have like a common theme in their lifestyle? Is there something that we can see, that we can learn, I guess, from, yeah, from their lifestyle or from their habits? Yeah, so, so uh, the, the first thing that we were interested to know is that they, they didn't get sick when everybody got sick and now they're sick just for more years, right? We wanted mm -hmm. to see if health span and lifespan is going together. And, and there are two points here. It's going together. I mean, they, see, they get sick 30 years later than a control, 20 to 30 years la later than a younger control group, okay? They, they already got sicker 40 years beyond their friends, okay, their cohort, but they're, they're really, they have an extensive health, they live healthier and longer, both are connected. But there's something even more important, they have a contraction of morbidity, which means they're sick less at the end of their lives, okay? We're sick years at the end of their life and they're six months at the end of their lives. And, and so they basically, they live, live, live and die, okay? Mm -hmm. rather than accumulating diseases. And this is really important because it's part of the concept of longevity dividend. You know, if we can get people healthier and we save uh, the economy on that, and then they die within a few weeks, the longevity dividends is in, in trillions of dollars, not on millions and billions. So the, the concept is important and it, it, uh, it is exemplified in our centenarians. Not only that, independently, the CDC, okay, the Center for the Disease Control in the news a lot in the United States, uh, have looked at the uh, cost, the, the last two years cost of life mm -hmm. uh, 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 for people who die over 100 versus those that die at 70, and it's third of the cost. In other words, it's confirmed. There is a longevity dividend for being healthy mm -hmm. and, 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 and then until you die, okay? So, so that's one thing. The, now to your question, really, uh, that, that was just an introduction, so you know they're healthy. Right. Um, so yeah. the question has to do with lifestyle, right? Uh, did they exercise? Were they lean? Were they caloric restricted? You know, you know, and all those things. And I, I have to say that this population is not good uh, for that purpose because they had genetics that slows their aging in spite of the fact that half of them were obese, overweight or obese, beside the facts that half of them were smokers, heavy smokers, beside the facts that less than 50% did moderate exercise, like, you know, walking or 
biking or housework. Um, so, uh, you know, 2% were vegetarians. So for this population, it wasn't necessary, but then that's kind of why we chose them. And, and that's what it exhibits, that it doesn't matter to them. We, ha we have a woman who um, smoked for over 90 years, okay? And so mm -hmm. uh, on one hand, yeah, if you smoke for over 90 years, you live a long life, right? But, but that's not the point. The point is that she could do that, okay? The rest of us will fall from uh, cancer, cardiovascular <laughs> disease and other and other problems. So I, I, I want to qualify really by saying that's not their strength. In fact, we, we had a paper where, because we have a longitudinal study on the offspring of centenarians, okay? Mm -hmm. And the offspring of centenarians inherited half of the genes, right, of their parents. And so we have offspring of centenarians and age match control. So we can really look at the effect of genes going forward and longitudinally, not, not just uh, cross-sectionally. And we matched the two groups with 1,400 people. Half of them are offspring of centenarians. And we matched them with uh, their BMI, with macronutrient. We asked them so many more questions, socioeconomy factors and others. And they were totally the same, totally the same. But they had half the cardiovascular disease. Okay, so you can see that for this population, the environment is not as important as to the rest of us. Okay, so you will give me a chance. I'll talk about what the, why the environment is important and what we can do, but not for those guys. Those guys got there in spite of it, not, not because of it. <laughs> I mean, so, so one thing is that we did notice, uh, so we watched like the, the Blue Zone, documentaries on Blue Zones, and like a lot of the old, the old guys, they're always um, like cheerful and, and bright and open and happy. And do you think that this, this is important? I mean, yes, but, but, but let me tell you, there, there are lots of happy people that also get cancer and die young. Okay. Right. Okay. So, okay. But, but let me exemplify the problem. We wrote several papers on the personality of our centenarians. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're extrovert and they're optimistic and they're socially connected and they move on and uh, they have just really a very positive personality, which uh, people took to assume from the papers we wrote that it's very important. It's part of getting there, okay? Maybe it's necessary to get there. Even if they have longevity gene and they have a different personality, maybe they won't get there, right? Um, until I met a 104-year-old uh, man and I went to visit him and he was the loveliest guy I ever met. And, you know, he was so positive. He had nothing bad to say about his daughter-in-law and all the people who could make his life miserable and decisions around him. It was just so thoughtful and nice and pleasant. So I go out of this interview thinking, you know, they're really special, those guys. I mean, this personality really drove him. Mm. And I run outside the house with his son. By the way, his son is almost 80, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm telling his son what I'm telling you, you know, the nicest guy I ever met. So the son looks in my eyes and says, you should have seen the son of a bitch when he was my age. He was a terrible, terrible man. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and then you realize that we say that personality, it's kind of known that personality is stable throughout mm -hmm. the years. You have your personality, you die with your personality. And, and I think people look into the 60s, maybe some of 70s. But, but listen, those guys, first of all, their brain has aged, okay? Physiologically, they're not demented, but their uh, brain has aged. They, their life has changed they moved several times okay they lost their spouse 
they moved to an old age home or a community, somebody else died, they had illness, you know, they had other things. And so what you see at the end of their life might be a total adaptation rather than a personality that was important for them throughout. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, I'm just putting it as a, as a warning out there. And that's why the longitudinal study is important. We're looking at their offspring and seeing how their personality affects their life, but more important, how their personality is changing when they go through 80 and, and higher. I'm, I'm just curious, because uh, the way we look at health is, has changed since like the, the original centenarians were in their 30s and 40s or 50s even. Um, and so are their offspring, do they live any more healthily now, I mean, in general, so would you expect them maybe to get maybe to get a bit even older, up to 120, or are they still like not um, so good? Yeah, I'm just curious. you know, um, this is a really uh, this is a really good question, uh, which is which is a subject for discussions that we have. You know, demographer. If you ask demographers, most of them say, oh, our life expectancy is just, is just a straight line, okay? We're going to get to 120, 130, 140, okay? That's how they see because they don't know the future. Uh, they know the past. And they say, look, we're just going on a straight line. Uh, two major problems with it. First of all, it wasn't a, a slope going up at 1900, only after that, okay? Before 1900, at 1800, 1700, thousand years ago, life expectancy was about 25 to 35, okay? Didn't change throughout. What, what has changed is a sore a antibiotics, <laughs> surgery, a water, right? I, I mean, a, me, then medical, I mean, that's what has changed, okay? And, and it changed in parallel, it's, it changed with delay, so it took time and, and every time we can still see the benefit of that. So I, I, I cannot say that it was, you know, that the, it started with age zero and we are for Oral, all our evolution are living longer. That's really not what happens. We have, for the first time of history, we have elderly. That never mm. happened. It was a rare event that we have an older adult. Most people died, okay? Mm. I mean, there are always older people, but most people died. The right. second problem, the second problem is that what demographers don't realize that we have a roof. We as a species, have our own maximal life expectancy. We also argue about it. I use 115 because that's the paper that I'm more influenced by. Although somebody have lived to 122 maybe, but you know, we have a potential as a human, as a species to get to 115. And by the way, we're less getting to less than age of 80 in most of the world. So we have 35 years that are relatively easy to realize in my mind. And it, it doesn't mean that we cannot go in the future, we cannot do those dramatic changes and, and live longer, but, but for us now, that's the potential. So there is a roof, okay? And mm -hmm. if there's a roof, it means that the line is going to flatten. And in fact, it does in many places in the world. In the United States, life expectancy now is going down, okay? Because of obesity because of the epidemic of narcotics and, and we even don't know about the virus yet. But life expectancy is going down. Uh, you know, it's hard to make uh, predictions in particular about the future, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. so I, I, I think this is crazy. I think we have a real challenge and we're getting to that. So. Yeah, I, I think that until this 115, we should push more people to be healthy. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know how it's going to work when this roof is coming closer now. Thank you all for watching. I hope that you found the video informative. It's great to hear from Professor Barzilai that the biology of aging can be targeted 
and we have moved from hope to promise. I think his idea of extending health span with longer lifespan being a side effect of this is very interesting. Please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button for new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and will speak to you again soon.